Even before World War II, the USA is one of the biggest economies in the world. In Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler refers to it as the American Colossus, already in 1923. Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto thinks the Japanese can run wild for six months. After that, I have no expectation of success because both fear America's industrial and military potential. Maybe most famously illustrated by Yamamoto's quote, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special episode about the American war machine. Okay, Yamamoto did not actually say that line, so don't write in. They had him say that famous line in the excellent 1970 movie motion picture film, Tora, Tora, Tora. It really is an amazing film though, right? Yep. I mean, you're, seriously, if, if you're gonna see a film about Pearl Harbor, watch that. If you're gonna, if you wanna really learn about Pearl Harbor, watch our miniseries. But still, the fact is that Yamamoto did fear that Japan would never be able to match America's long-term potential. That was not based on America's previous accomplishments though. During the Great War, the US relied on archaic mobilization plans, mustering hundreds of thousands of troops, but failing to mobilize its industry to facilitate modern warfare. US suppliers didn't manage to produce more than 143 of the 50,000 artillery pieces the US government ordered in 1917 by the time the war was over. Seeing the flaw in that, military planning is reformed a few years after that war. A joint Army and Navy Munitions Board is established in June 1922 to coordinate munitions procurement. The Army Industrial College is set up in 1924 to prepare officers and civilians for military resource management. However, this reform effort runs out of steam as America isolates and turns to a non-interventionist position in the 1920s. Add to that military budget cuts caused by the advent of the Great Depression, making the US military very much underprepared for any war that should break out at that time. By the 1930s, World War I munitions and weapon stocks are running dry, forcing the US military to think about modern equipment production. In the old days, the military would just tell civilian manufacturers what they'd need and they'd deliver. However, expansionist movements in Italy, Germany, and Japan caused some to argue that the US should always prepare for war since in case of war with any of them, demand would be dramatically higher than any possible supply without proper planning. Bernard Baruch, a former advisor to World War I President Woodrow Wilson, thinks that economic mobilization should be a part of war plans. In other words, he pleads for a planned wartime economy. The new Industrial Mobilization Plan, IMP, allows federal agencies bridging the gap between military and industry to mobilize the economy in a time of war. A National Defense Advisory Council further tightens the bonds. The 1939 Protective Mobilization Plan, the PMP, and War Resources Board approach military planning holistically, including industrial capacity and logistics. And all of this planning turns into some action. The U.S. starts stockpiling essential and strategic raw materials like, like rubber and oil in 1937. Restraints on military contracting are slowly lifted. Military budgets grow from 1.2 of GDP in 1938 to 1 1.7 in 1940 to 5.1 in 1941. Yet in September 1939, the United States has fewer divisions than Romania. War production makes up less than 2% of the total gross national product. To say that the US is not ready for global war is an understatement. There is potential though. The US economy accounts for roughly 20% of the global economy in 1938. National income is almost double that of Germany, Japan, and Italy combined. Its industrial potential already shows. In 1937, the American automotive industry produces 4.8 million cars. Germany produces some 331,000 cars and Japan only 26,000. Then on September 8, 1939, Franklin Roosevelt announces a limited national emergency. It includes the strengthening of our national defense within the limits of peacetime authorizations. Under the PMP, the industry is already slowly converting to a war economy even before any actual state of war exists. 
In May 1940, 50,000 new aircraft are ordered. In 1940, $8 billion are allocated for Army spending. In 1941, another $26 billion. In March 1941, the Lend-Lease Act is signed, allowing the U.S. to aid the Allies with American-made ordnance. 8,250 tanks, 7 million rifles, 3,400 AA guns, and 2,100 artillery pieces worth $7 billion are ordered. Factories slowly but steadily start to convert. Mainly automobile factories, of which roughly half have not been used since the Great Depression, pick up the orders. As empty factories fill up with new workers, unemployment drops. In 1939, the U.S. unemployment rate is still pretty bad at 17.2%, but will dip to 1.9% by 1943. Anyway, this is still before the U.S. participates in the war, the so-called defense phase. The Army is still only planning for its domestic defense and maybe some Lend-Lease ordnance. But it doesn't need too much to do that, at least not as much as it would need for an overseas adventure with millions of troops. In the summer of 1941, Roosevelt orders an unlimited national emergency. He asks Secretary of War Henry Stimson to determine how much of everything is needed to defeat all potential enemies in an offensive war. This results in the Victory Plan. Based on the projected availability of 10 million servicemen in 1943, note, the U.S. has just over 132 million inhabitants in 1941, a list of equipment, weapons, vehicles, uniforms, and all that is made. This would cost as much as $150 billion. No way Congress is going to allow for that, right? Well, no. No. Not in peacetime. But after the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th, 1941, the sleeping giant truly starts to awaken. In January, Roosevelt publicly recites his wish list of 60,000 aircraft in 1942, 125,000 in 1943, 120,000 tanks, and 55,000 AA guns, for starters. The victory plan, like most other plans, has been overtaken by reality. Earlier planning saw 18,000 planes being constructed in 1941, not 60,000. Instead of a slow conversion, everything is now converted practically overnight. But despite the chaos, the Great Forge of Liberty is fired up. A new war productions board oversees the conversion of remaining peacetime industries to serve the war economy. Headed by Donald Nelson at first, they have the authority to force a manufacturer to accept a contract. Lists of items to be produced by certain industries are distributed. All automobile CEOs are asked to make machine guns, engines, and turbine blades instead of cars. GM gets a $2 billion contract for producing all sorts of stuff, including tanks. So do Chrysler and Ford. In total, 25,000 prime contractors and 120,000 subcontractors rush to work. In large part, the government pays for the huge rise in expenses through borrowing, raising taxes, and issuing war bonds. The only real restraints are materials and labor capacity. From here, the USA's economy almost fully shifts to a war economy. While the U.S. manufactured 3 million, mainly civilian, automobiles in 1941, they produced 139 over the rest of the war. That, that's it, 139 cars. In addition to tanks and trucks, the industry is tasked with producing battleships, guns, bullets, fuel, synthetic rubber, munitions, uniforms, and, and, and foodstuffs. The development of new types of vehicles, engines, and weapon systems immediately starts booming. The first M4 Grant Sherman's roll off the Chrysler conveyor belts in Detroit on July 22, 1942. Chrysler is rewarded with a public E for production excellence, motivating manufacturers by public recognition, but of course also with big profitable government contracts. Production steadily increases over the next years, reaching its peak in 1943 and 1944. Now, allow me to share some details about what that looks like. The steep rise in production is already noticeable in 1942. While in 1941, about 4,000 tanks were produced, about 25,000 are produced in 1942. In 1941, 617,000 small arms and about 100,000 machine guns are made. 
2.3 million and 660,000 in 1942. In 1941, 318 B-17 and B-24 heavy bombers. In 1942, 2,618. Airplanes in general? Instead of the projected 17,000 and the absolute maximum of 45,000 experts thought was possible, they produced close to 48,000 of them already in 1942. By the end of 1942, the US produces more war stuff than Japan, Germany, and Italy combined. Every year that follows, production will increase, reaching a peak in 1944, when 40% of the world's munitions are produced in the United States of America. Remember how in 1939, the US spent 2% of its GDP on war production? In 1944, that number is 44%. The mining, manufacturing, and construction industries double their output between 1939 and 1944. Production capacity increases by 50% in that time. In 1944, 18.7 million more Americans have jobs than five years earlier, roughly 11 million in the military and 7.7 .7 million in factories. U.S. unemployment drops to just 1.2% in 1944. At this point, available manpower is the only thing holding back more growth. Now, I did not talk about the experience for the workers, male and female alike, or about the political uproar that a rapid economic mobilization caused, whether it be the suspension of antitrust laws, repression of unions, the exorbitant spending, or the profits made by industrial mammoths. That is for the future. For now, it is clear that Yamamoto and Hitler were certainly right to fear America's industrial potential. In mere months, the American war machine produces a quantity higher than anyone could have imagined. Maybe it's better to let sleeping giants lie, for there may be no keeping up with a giant once he's awake. If you would like to see what happened while America was asleep, you can watch a Between Two Wars episode about American isolationism in the interwar years right here and join the war effort of the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and subscribe to this fantastic channel and all of our fantastic channels and make sure to ring that little bell so you don't ever miss a single episode. See you next time.